Okay. We'll just wait for that. That's it. Excellent. Okay. Um, as I say, starting again, last time we, uh, we spoke about, uh, um, uh, we spoke about developing good habits. Uh, we discussed situational awareness, uh, the effects of stress, which are pretty, you know, can be really quite strong. Um, always having a plan and that's long-term and short-term and uh, entry into the mountains, uh, which was the initial discussion. And what we're going to have a look at today, and it's going to take a, a wee bit of time, is we're going to look at uh, entry routes in and out of the mountains just a wee bit further. Uh, we're going to look at soaring hours available, uh, the average cross-country speed that, uh, you know, because when you have a day, you sort of turn around and say, what can I get out of the day? And we'll discuss that, uh, that a bit. What the recent weather has been doing, because that's going to have an effect on the day itself, whether it's been wet or dry over the last few days. And then we're going to look at um, uh, cloud bases throughout the day, thermal strength, and uh, streeting. When can we get streeting? Uh, when we're planning our tasks, when to fly into wind or downwind. And then we'll be looking at convergences in quite a bit of detail. Um, we'll be looking at, uh, obviously, if you get a convergence, you're going to get, you can get mountain convergences, but convergences, you, people usually think about them as sea breeze front. But you do get mountain convergences as well, which we'll discuss. But obviously, if we get a, a, a sea breeze front, we've got the sea air coming in. Uh, another problem that we have, particularly in Scotland, is spread out of the cloud. Uh, it over convex, and the other effect is uh, high level cloud. Now, lastly, the most important thing is that on a thermal day, you're looking at launching anywhere between half past 10 and 12 o'clock. And so everybody's thinking the same thing. And you've got to make sure that you're at the front of the queue. And it can really mess up your day. Um, it can really mess up your day if you end up at the back of the group. So, I mean, that uh, my advice there is to get away early rather than late. So, let's just, as a matter of interest, this picture is, I think it's um, approaching Loch Leven, not our Loch Leven, um, but Loch Leven, uh, which is uh, which where Balik Luig is, uh, is on. And I think that's Loch Leaney in the. Um, uh, on the horizon there. And um, it was a fantastic day. Cloud base was up to 6,500 feet. Most of the time was floating about, about 5,500 feet. And um, it really is quite spectacular because you've got Glencoe off to the right. And uh, there are fields about up there. Um, but that's the sort of spectacular scenery that we can get. And, and I was doing a, a cross country from uh, going to Dalmally from Portmo and then up to Loch Coik, and then back to uh, Port, Port Mo. But I was having a chat with Bill Fulton this morning, and uh, Bill's got a DG300, does a lot of work for the club. And one of the things that he was saying, because I was asking what, what, the, uh, what he thought of the talk, and um, he said, well, you know, I don't, I don't go far. Well, you don't have to. Um, yeah, we've got the Ockhills, and if we go up the Ockhills, you get to Dolo. It's a fantastic ridges there for Southerlies, and that is really mountainous. So we don't have to go far. It's literally just twenty kilometres. And the other thing is, is, is that you don't have to go and place yourself where you, you're becoming uncomfortable because you go to places like Feshi, which are right in the mountains, and you've got the Spey Valley there, and so you can go and explore the mountains from other sites. And on that note, Bob Petrie gave me uh, a video, which I'm going to uh, attempt to uh, play, because uh, we were talking about golden eagles, and Bob was flying, and he met two. And so I'll play this video, and we'll see what you think of it. So I'll just put it up. There we go. And I'll just play it. And let's just see if it's all right.
So, I don't think videos do the justice. That that will live in Bob's mind for the rest of his life. And um, you know, it's it's to me that's just who cares about cross countries and all this sort of stuff. If you get flights like that, then that's going to live in your memory for uh, you know forever. Uh, you know, that's the great sort of thing about flying from from in in, in Scotland. That, that we have. It's it's fantastic. Uh, any comments on that at all? Yeah, if I could butt in, uh, Sent. <clears throat> can you Glad hear me? To see you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, um, I don't want to get competitive, but uh, there was an occasion when I was flying over over uh, <laughs> Tengal Mountain on a paraglider. And I was unfortunately coming down in one of the really roughy, tuppy looking corries, uh, nowhere to land, brick, you know, rocks the size of uh, transit vans and all the rest. And I thought I saw a buzzard ahead of me circling about 500 meters away. So I thought, OK, this might save my legs because that's what was going to get broken if I landed in there. And I glided off to this uh, to this buzzard in inverted commas. And when I got a little bit closer, brackets coming into the thermal underneath it, I thought, hmm, that's a big buzzard. And just as I thought that, his undercarriage dropped down, brackets, talons, and his wings came in, OK, and he dived down towards the front of my wing. Um, now, you guys probably don't know this, but if you collide with a very big bird on a paraglider, the whole wing folds up and you die, OK? So I saw this bird coming down at me and I'm sort of thinking, right, how do I deal with this? Ah, I know how I deal with this. I pretend to be super passive because got to remember I'm in a harness, a cocoon harness that completely covers my body and I've got sunglasses on. But I radiate. I am not a threat. I am not a threat. And the next thing I know, the little bugger, I say little bugger, he appears under my wing and comes and parks about a meter off my right shoulder and looks at me. OK, and I'm thinking, yeah, OK, right. Keep pretending to be super passive. Doesn't matter. I'm still descending towards the rocks. I don't want to die with this character. And he he sits there for a while and then he goes for I mean, the control is unbelievable. He goes forward about a meter, flies across directly in front of me, parks on my left side and looks at me from that. And I'm and now now he was thinking An ornithologist has told me they're very bright and very inquisitive. And he probably thought, what's this poor bastard monkey doing up here? <laughs> OK, and then what he did and I'm OK, this is a very positive, humanistic, inter anthropomorphic interpretation, if you like. But he then having spent about 10 minutes with me, he then glided off. And I thought, I know where he's going. And he glided off and he whack, he went straight into a booming thermal. So, of course, I followed him and it was a cracker. Felt like about six knots, I think. And I called it and as I, we climbed up and he climbed about another 200 feet and then he just left it. And I think he wanted to make sure I didn't make a mess where he lived. <laughs> and that thermal took me to clown base, which on that day was eight grand. And off I went. But as you said, that experience just literally blew my mind. Anyway, I'll leave you with that. Well, this is the thing about flying in the hills. I mean, wave flying is one thing, but thermal soaring is a bit more uh, vibrant. You know, it, it, it's much more, to be blunt, I think it's much more challenging and exciting. Um, I, I think of wave flying as being a bit more cerebral. But as, as you say, Tony, I mean, moments like that, they, they, they go to the great ball. Uh, they're just fantastic. Uh, to continue with getting back to, to the nitty gritty of it, we, we had a quick look at, at, at uh, thermal routes in, into the mountains. And, and the way I think of the Oak Hills is, is, is as a ladder. And um, here we've got the Oak Hills here. Now, depending on the day, I mean, the thing I was talking about when we were showing slide one is, is yeah, if we look at soaring hours available, um, well, that obviously depends on the day, but obviously in the summer, we get a lot more. So depending on how long you've got, you turn around and say, what can I achieve? Now, just to give you an idea, the wind is 10 miles an hour. If you say the wind's 10 miles an hour, 
that 16 kph, 10 miles an hour, we're not talking knots, we're talking miles per hour. So that's 16 kph. So if you just stay in a the thermal for three hours, you're going to cover 48 kilometers. So all you've got to do is find a thermal and the wind's going to drift you. And so if you particularly go downwind, then you're going to do your silver distance. And when you're early solo, I mean, I work, when I'm planning my cross countries, I work on an average of 75 kph. I say I can, depending on the day, because if it's a bad day, it'll be 60. But if it's a reasonable day, so I can do 75 kph. And I say I've got, you know, five, six hours of soaring available. So what can I do in that day? And that's how I determine how, how much I can do. But I mean, I think if you start off with something like 30 kph, then I think that's, that's perfectly okay. So again, when we're looking at the entry routes into the mountain, we were talking right at the beginning about whether to take a winch launch or an aero tow. The Ock Hills are going to start going off usually before Port Moak is. And if we're around this area, cloud base would be about two and a half thousand feet when it starts popping off. If it's a reasonable day, about half past 10, 11 o'clock. But by the time you get to here, it'd be about 4,000 feet. And they can jump across to this part here. And then obviously you can make out and go off in various directions as Kate rightly pointed out last week. But what normally happens as well is, is that on the first leg out, you'll get the thermals starting and you can go straight over. And later on in the day, we're talking about sea air, we'll be talking about sea air later. You'll get the sea air coming in and that will destroy this area. We'll, we'll, we'll have a, a long talk about that uh, a wee bit later. But again, going this way, you've got the Sidlows and again, going up that way. So, you know, the, the, the thing I always think about is, is that can be my entry route in the morning. This is always a sure fire route at whatever time of the day. But coming back, what tends to happen is you tend to get the sea air coming in over the flatlands. And generally, it's just not as good thermal conditions compared to that of the mountains. And so um, I always tend to plan my entry, my, my return routes to come in this way, because I know even if the sea air is going, that this will give me uh, uh, the possibility of some lift. And you only need about 3,000, 3,500 feet, depending on your glider and the wind direction, to get back to Port Moat from the end of the uh, Occult. So again, if it's wet, then obviously these, or if it's been wet over the last few days, obviously the valleys and the rivers are going to be wetter. The mountains, basically, they dry out from the top going down, unless obviously it's been snowing. But, you know, basically the tops of the mountains will dry out before the bottom of the mountains. And so they're generally the greatest best, best part of, you know, get better lift. From, from that point of view. Um, cloud based throughout the, day, throughout the day, generally max solar heating is at about one o'clock, two o'clock. But if you're in the mountains, the cloud base will go up and stay up until six or seven o'clock in the evening. You can still be thermaling in the mountains at six or seven, whereas in the flatlands it's died off. And again, from Dunkeld here, you only need about five and a half, six thousand feet to get back to uh, Port Moat. But you see a lot of the pilots, a lot of the pilots that do cross country, what they're doing is they're setting their stuck starts to start at places like Glen, uh, Glen Devon or Octorada uh, and, and, you know, uh, and I use Comrie quite a bit because uh, I know I, I can get back to Port Moat from about five and a half thousand feet uh, from, from uh, Comrie. So yeah, thermal strength, uh, again, you've got to, got to look at that. And, and, and as I say, what we're going to be looking at is RASP and um, uh, because it's free. And so we're just going to look at RASP charts today. Uh, Spreeting. I was having a chat with John Williams earlier in the day. And, and John, we were talking about streeting because John's, well, particularly in Easterlies, you can get some really nice days and you can get cloud streets. Well, how do we define, how do we get cloud streets? Well, basically, if the wind at 2000 feet is 15 knots, and then at 4000 feet, it's 20 knots, and at 6000 feet, it's 18 knots. So what you've got is an increasing wind and then reducing wind. And 
uh, an inversion layer, that's not necessarily uh, applicable all the time, then you'll get streeting. So basically the winds being above 50 knots increasing and then reducing as we get up to the top of, uh, uh, of, of the thermal layer. Um, other things that we're talking about is when to fly into wind or downwind. Obviously, if you're streeting, you can go up and down wind. But what I tend to do when I set a task, and these are all the things that you need to think about is, is I normally start my task with a downwind component. What I do is try and fly into wind at the best time of the day, which is between usually about one and four o'clock, and then do the downwind leg uh, in while the day is dying. That's the basic theory of it. So we're going to talk about convergences, sea air, spread out. Well, I'll talk about spread out. Where spread out usually causes, and it happens a lot in Scotland, is that basically what it, the reason is, is because we've got quite a wet air mass. And so we've got, we've got, uh, uh, you have what's called the condensation layer when the cloud uh, starts to condense out. But if if the air is very humid and you've got an inversion on top of it, that's when you're going to get it spread out. And it depends on the amount of heating that dispenses it, because you'll get days where you get spread out, sun will burn it off, cure form, and then it will spread out. And it basically depends on the level of humidity of the air mass. Um, and the more humid it is, the more spread out you're going to get, basically. Uh, any questions, uh, any points that uh, Kate, John or, or Phil, uh, Tony want to make on that? Because that's quite a bit, quite a mouthful there. OK, we'll move on from that. We'll move to the next slide. It really is worth having a good think about that. Now, we covered the routes and what I'm quickly going to do is just go through these slides and you can have a look at them for the various areas because we spoke about we spoke about uh, the plateau low relief areas, and Kate discussed area one last week, and the you know, and basically how many fields there were, um, and there it is. There's area one, and I've put it up. They so can just have a look at it, and you know, you can stop the video and have a look at you know where the fields are, and then we're looking at area two, which is here. We've got the A9. There's a plateau area where you've got to be a be we be we be a bit uh, careful, and here as well. But here we've got the Spey Valley. Okay, so we've got area two, got area three, which is basically to the south of one. You've got the D Valley where there's field, Glen Clover, and this area here tends to be a bit bleak. Okay, so you've got to be careful drawing passing that area and then Feshi's up there. And then we've got area four, which is to the, uh, again, to the north uh, west of uh, Aboyne, and Feshi's just, uh, Feshi's just here, or around here, where's Feshi? Uh, yeah, Feshi's just around here. And basically you've got the Grampians, sorry, the Cairngorm, should I say, and that's pretty high, about three and a half thousand feet. So you've got to be careful about that, as you can see, there's various fields around there. And then area five, which is to the southeast of, uh, uh, of Loch Ness. I almost landed in that field there a few, oh, sorry, I almost landed in that field a few years ago. And I'll show you a photograph of that later on. And so this is an area that you've got to be a wee bit careful. But again, we've got valleys. Uh, as I say, here's, here's um, especially around here. And lastly, we've got area six which is where we're to the basically to the east and to the northeast of uh, of um, of sky and garvey's just just up here um and you've got uh, torridon and so on and all that and that's all really beautiful and this is a photograph of roy he was going between lock boyk and garvey as i say garvey was to the top end top uh, right hand corner of the previous and spectacular mountains and particularly when you get up to Loch Torridon and up that way you're starting to get into the flow country and that is really spectacular. Okay so we've done about 20 minutes there. 
All right. Now I put this slide up because I put it up for when I was doing wave soaring and the same applies uh, for all the weather patterns. You know, they have an effect on, on thermal soaring. And basically this area, if we look at the Koppen um, climate type, this area is subpolar, whereas the rest of the UK is oceanic. That's a, just one type of definition of climate in the UK. But the UK is unique in that, um, well, not unique, but we're at the crossroads of the weather. And basically we've got the polar front that passes over us, moves south and north. And uh, again, I spoke at that, about that in quite some detail with reference to wave because it has good effects on wave. But it also affects thermal flying because basically here we've got the jet stream and north of the jet stream, you'll get polar oceanic, which is cold air, but it's also quite wet coming down from the Arctic. And we'll get the polar continental, which uh, where it is cold and dry when it comes down because it's coming off the continent. And that is a fabulous air mass. And we get a lot of it in the spring. And it, it can be excellent. Um, you, I always think of these air masses as sort of like uh, you've got these lava lights, you know, these sort of blobby, and air masses are like big blobs and amoebas moving around and merging and all the rest of it. And so you'll get a mix of polar oceanic and polar continental. It will vary as to how dry it is. And I mean, a lot of the time it'll be quite wet up here and it will be fantastic soaring conditions. But basically, a polar air mass can be very good for thermals. If polar oceanic tends to be a wee bit too unstable, whereas polar continental is pretty well ideal. Temperate oceanic, we're looking at the Azores high, and that's not very good for thermals, basically. Uh, whereas temperate continental, when we get the air, you, you can get uh, southern England affected by it. And it depends, it tends to be quite hazy. More often than not, it's, it's not particularly great, but if the temperatures are very high, then you do get good thermal conditions. So basically what I'm saying is what we really want is a polar continental air mass. Anybody want to make a comment about that? Any, any, any thoughts on that? Tony, anything to say about that? Just a, a brief observation that I suspect most people already know. Obviously, for purposes of illustration, you've divided the group area up into four with their respective positions. And obviously, given front, uh, given high pressure and low pressure systems and the way that in which they rotate, you can often have a polar continental air mass coming at you from the southwest, for example. Absolutely. Just to point that out, it doesn't yeah. necessarily mean they come yeah. in from that direction. That's all. Yeah. I mean, this is just a very simple diagram, which you have to look. What you do is you look at the synoptic chart and you see where the air is coming from, basically. Is it coming from the cold areas or is it coming from the warm air? And, and, and you know, it, it does move about a lot. It, it really does. And the polar front can be way down over, over Spain or it can be up around, uh, around the Faroes. It, this is just where, where it's, I've made it a simplification. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Right. Okay, so we'll move on. Now I was going to come on to rust, and um, which is, um, as I say, I use three three um, uh, met uh, met apps. Uh, Rasp is three, and um, I couldn't get a picture of the star rating because <laughs> I never keep them. And so I had to search the web and all I could find was the one for uh, uh, Devon. And uh, uh, the rating is one for five and five is obviously cracking as we can see over Dartmoor here. And one of the things to remember about RASP is, is when we're looking at the star rating, it's only for the hour. It's only for the hour that you, you've selected. So you have to look at the star rating over the whole of the day to work out what it is. Whereas Top Meteo and uh, SkySight, what they do is they give you a predictive flight distance for the whole day. 
So you have to treat RASP star rating uh, with a certain bit of caution. And we're going to start talking a wee bit about uh, convergences because I'm going to use the example of um, the uh, seventh, uh, sorry, the fifth of July uh, two years ago. And these charts are taken at 1500, right? Um, because I looked at the day and I've been looking at RAFs and I find these fascinating charts uh, because of what they're showing. Okay, so this is the, as I say, it's for three o'clock. And what it's showing is the cloud base. And what we can see is that here, the cloud base is almost 7,500 feet. And here it's blue. And here it's not showing much cloud. And then there's a bit of cloud here. And there's crack here at 2,000 feet. And we look here and we see all this blue shit. So what we can see is that the cloud base here, what a little cloud there is, is only about 2,000 feet, and yet it jumps there to over 5,000. And I sort of look at that, and instantly I see a picture like that. I'm sort of thinking that looks like a convergence. And I, I, you know, to me, this is just a, a fascinating picture. Because most of us think bloody pervert is weird, but um, I find that really fascinating. Um, so if we go, so that is the cloud base. And as I say, uh, it's given for a given time. Now, I find this chart particularly useful. And uh, it's, uh, I'll just put it back because that's a wee bit quick. Um, it's the thermal buoyancy shear ratio. And again, for 1500. Now, what that is, it's a combination of two th charts. It's, um, it's uh, thermal strength and also the buoyancy shear ratio. Now, what that means is the buoyancy shear is saying how buoyant is the areas, but how much shear you got. Basically, the more wind you're going to get, the more shear you're going to get. And as we can see, in the mountains, there's hardly any shear here. Whereas here, there's tons of shear, right? Absolutely ton. We look at that, there's shear up there, and that's particularly bad. So looking at that, I look at that, and I say to myself, that is a definite convergence. Uh, because that is just pure rubbish. And we've got, as we can see, See it, the air's coming. This is on a slack westerly buoyancy shear down here. So this is a nice area around here. That's really good. This is getting more difficult. Very very useful chart, and I would say that RASP do the best buoyancy shear charts, in my opinion. They're the clearest ones, and they're really important charts for the thermal story, as we'll talk to we'll come to later as well. So as I say, I've been thinking to myself, I've just have to look at these two charts and I think no, it's a bit of convergence there. So what is a convergence? Um, well, basically you can have mountain convergences or you can have sea breeze convergences. Mountain convergences is where you can get thermals heating up on both sides of the mountain, meeting in the middle, and they'll follow, they'll follow a, a line uh, uh, the ridge lying along the mountains. Now, if, if you have a look on the BGA Facebook uh, page, there's recent, there's a really good photograph of a chap in Australia, and maybe you'll be able to come in on this in a bit, Phil, um, who's just done a 1300 kilometer fly in Australia, and he's flying along this uh, enormous convergence of just thermal convergence. And it's it's a lovely picture. It's on it's on it's on the BGA Facebook page, and uh, it's very good. But I haven't put it on here because that's that's Australian. But what you need for for a, a convergence to happen is, as I say, you can have mountain convergences, but what you need is a slack flow. And so here we've got a very slack westerly flow. And what happens is is during the day, without going into too great a details, the air heats up and forms, you get a high pressure at altitude and a low pressure, you know, because it heats up, you get a low pressure at low level, relatively, 
and the sea air drags in. Now, the problem with the sea air, particularly in Scotland, you see you get these fantastic convergences down south in, in England. But what happens in Scotland is that they will follow the valleys. And so you'll get the sea air coming down Loch Ness. You'll definitely get it, we're definitely coming down Loch Ness. You'll get it coming up the D Valley, sorry, the Spey Valley there. And you'll get it coming up the D Valley. And lots of times I've been thermaling in the mountains and I go into the Tay Valley and I find myself in sea air. It doesn't necessarily form a front, right? Which we'll talk about in a minute. Because for, for a front to form, it's got to be air from one way and air from the other. So they've got to be pretty much opposite each other. And so that's one of the things that happens. And it will come up here. And as I say, the Oak Hills will still be producing lift, but the sea air will be coming past the Oak Hills. And you'll find the Oak Hills will keep going while Port Moak is in sea air. But to get a proper convergence, it's basically, or sea breeze convergence, what you want is the air being at 90 degrees. If it's at a more acute angle, you won't get much, or when I say acute, um, yes, if it's a more acute angle, then you'll tend not to get a convergence. And so the ideal conditions for a convergence is that basically if the wind, and when we're talking about the prevailing wind is less than five to six knots, you've got a good chance of a convergence. Six to eight knots, you've got some chance. And above, if the prevailing flow is above 10 knots, you haven't got much of a chance of, sea air, of, a, sea, of a convergence. And as I spoke about earlier, once we get to 15 knots, we're then starting to get into the realms of streeting, of cloud streeting and so on. And again, with this wind increase and then reducing as you get to the top of the boundary layer. And what they talk about, what they mean by the boundary layer is the air is the part of the uh, atmosphere that is affected by surface heating and by ridges and things like that, not waves. Okay, so, so there is, I've just done that as a pictorial thing. And as I say, the important thing to remember is that Scotland, it can come up the valleys and ruin your day. And so sometimes you have to jump across the valleys. Um, you know, and they won't necessarily, if the wind, as we can see here, if the wind's coming in from this direction here, then you won't necessarily get a convergence or not a very good convergence. Right. Any any comments on that? Phil, you've flown down south, you know, in the tropical areas. What comments would you make about convergences in, in the tropics? <clears throat> um, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, yep. Yes. And, um, well, I, I guess just to back up right up, I mean, I find, actually, I've got to say sometimes I find convergences a bit confusing, not just not to fly in, but just the concept of them. Um, so, you know, you were talking about mountain ridges, you've got thermals along a ridge. I mean, yes, the air is blowing up both sides of the mountain, but to me, that's just a big thermal. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I get the sea breeze one, that's fairly straightforward. I've seen um, convergences in, in, in France and New Zealand, which have been caused by mountain massives basically instead of a simple ridge you've got a whole clump of mountains very light winds are generally kicking off a large number of thermals and they induce local flow around them and those flows sometimes come together and and uh, converge and create another line of lift beyond sort of normal thermal lift yeah um so i've seen that uh, i've also seen mechanical convergence in New Zealand where you get intersecting valleys, you'll get wind coming up valleys in different directions. So wind, prevailing wind is trying to blow through a mountain range of Southern Alps in New Zealand, for example, and the wind will make its way along the valleys. And some of these valleys join up again. I mean, you can think of a local example that'd be just by um, Balin Lewig, uh, where you've got the, the Tay Valley and the valley to the north coming down from Pit Lockery. You've got two valleys can run into one another there and you can get convergences there. I, 
I think that's the whole point. I think that's the whole point. And that's good that you brought that up, Bill, because yeah, when you're in the mountains, you do get all these effects. And it's a matter of recognizing them. The sea breeze is easily recognizable. Um, but I must admit, there's been certain times when I've been flying in the mountains, particularly late in the afternoon, around five, six, when you can see these just lines of energy where they've got organized, where the winds, the local wind valleys have got organized, and they're almost sort of self perpetuating, which is my point, and everything yeah. gets organized. Um, and it, it, it just depends upon the day because um, it can vary. It can be, you know, positive, it can be negative. Um, but uh, it's quite fascinating. I find in the mountains compared to the flatlands. In the flatlands, it's 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 a lot easier because there's there's no you know, unless you're talking about soil type, which may vary you know the strength of thermal. But I I find it fascinating in the mountains that that aspect. Of it. Okay, right. We'll move on on that for a bit. So we'll just carry on on convergences and. And the reason why I'm going on about them is because I use them for, for task planning, um, because I've shown you the uh, uh, cloud base, I've shown you the uh, thermal strength, and the one that always clinches it, which is a chart that's not used much, which is the a convergence chart, which is, let me just bring that back, it's a wee bit too quick, which is the boundary layer, as I was talking about, max up and down and again this is for 1500 and i mean when i look at that i think i am going to use that because i looked at it the day before and there it was there's this bloody great convergence so i thought i'm going to use that for my task All right now if we look up here here are other convergences and i was talking about the sea air coming down coming down Loch Ness. And if you look, there's other little convergences as well. So these are, again, potentially usable. And I mean, that sticks out like a donkey's widget for me. And if you look at it, right, it goes all the way down. And if it wasn't for the TMA, you could go right down into Southern England on that. Oh, sorry, into Northern England on that. So really worth looking at these charts on on good days because one of the things that always messes us up is when we go away from full smoke is what is the sea air going to do because inevitably if it's a good thermal day the air gets dragged in from the sea and we always find that we're having to glide back to port moat through pretty rubbishy air so as you can see what i did was uh, this is the task that i did that day and I planned it, right? So I turned around and as I say, there's a prevailing slack westerly. I thought, well, I can go straight across the valley for my, uh, um, you know, first leg. And, you know, basically what I'm doing, cloud base is gonna be relatively low in the hill, in the flatlands. Perth is a good source of thermals, big town. It's always gonna be, you know, quite useful and, uh, this is this trace is a speed trace, by the way. Uh, so the uh, uh, you know shifting towards the red side. So green is relatively slow. So I made my way into the mountains, and I went up to uh, Locking Door Castle, and it wasn't very good up there. It was uh, I had to be. It was a little bit blue actually, and I had to be a wee bit careful going into Locking Door Castle. And so I then came down to. Uh, Comrie, and and then I started to pick up the sea breeze, right? So I picked up the sea breeze, and then I used it pretty well up to about about here, and then went up to Feshi, and by this time the sea breeze was around here now, and I picked it up here, and as you can see from the speed, and now it's moved across, right? Because it's coming across this way and I used it to get home. Okay, so this is me using the weather to plan the task. Now, and I finished at Comrie, 
because I knew that I, you know, it was going to be pretty rubbishy here. And then I glided my way back because I was about five and a half, six thousand feet and just glid back. From there. So that's the way I've, I've planned the task for that particular day. Now, I'm a cautious pilot, uh, you know, and, and me, I always take the easy route because I'm a lazy so and so. I don't want to stress myself out. So I just want to go and enjoy myself. And um, John Williams had planned a, a, a 400k triangle somewhere up here. I can't remember the name of it now. He went up, he went up somewhere up here and then across to Mossack and then back um, towards uh, Glen Devon, which was his star. So I, th I showed those pictures and this is me on my third leg, right? And that's Blair Gowrie there, that's Loch Tummel, and I'm flying the sea breeze, right? And there, there is the sea breeze, I'm quite close to it. There's a, a shelf cloud there. And as you can see, lovely thermals going up to, uh, you know, uh, where is it? Uh, Feshies sort of up that way. So there we have a good example of the sea breeze. So that was on the third leg. And then I've showed you this picture before, and that's absolutely stunning because that went, this is, this is, um, Lynn of D is just, just, well, let me just move it. Lynn of D is just down here. And this is where I'm talking about the flatlands, right? I, I brought this picture up on the first session. And I mean, you look at that. And why do I love it? It's because I'm flying along in straight lines and I can go fast, which is what I like about gliding. I like, I'm not into this turning business. I like going around in straight lines and I like going fast. And to me, I just think it's Fantastic. Now, John, as I say, he he um, he uh, um, was trying to do a 400k triangle, and as I say, he was he was up at Mossat, and here we've got the convergence, and you can see what's happened is all the sea air has come in, and we've got all this strato Q crap. But as I say, because the wind, the wind is westerly. But here the wind where John in is northeasterly. So it's 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 sliding, they're sliding past each other. So there's not a lot of there's not a lot of uh, uh, uplift there. But as it as you get round the corner, as you come round the cap Cairn Gorms, then obviously it, it starts to improve. But there's an example of of not a very good convergence, it's pretty poor. Uh, uh, and John found it that way, but he got he got onto it and he managed to tweak his way around and, and, and get into the better stuff. Now there's another flight that John did, which I'll leave John to talk about if he's online. Are you with us, John? You have to, may have to unmute yourself. Yep, I'm with you. <clears throat> okay, John. Anything you want to say about that before I move on to the next slide for you? Yeah, if you leave that one there for a second. Um, okay. So task setting rules. Uh, you've been through all that wonderful theoretical stuff, uh, which I completely ignore. And my rules of task setting are <laughs> much more simple. Uh, you try and work out what Zed's going to do that day. And then you... You, you add 20% to that, which is what I need for handicap, and then a little bit more for fun, and go for it. So Are you I'm, with us, Ed? Are you with us, Ed? I may have to unmute yourself. If, if, you're... if he is, he's, he's uh, muted. Oh, all right. Um, okay, sorry, carry on, so, John. So, so that results in some kind of uh, optimistic task setting, uh, which is what happened on that particular case. And so s s straight ahead over the nose, you can see a clearly defined sea breeze front, but it was just so weak with the overcast that I couldn't really make it work. And if you, can you go back to the previous slide, Sam? Yep. Uh, this is where you said Lynn of D is just off to the left. Yeah. Um, where Sant is here is stunning, gorgeous, high speed running in good lift and sunshine. Uh, imagine being half a mile to the left of that, low in the hills, sea breeze coming in, sea air, uh, in among the mountains, 
with total turbulence. And I spent the best bit of an hour trying to work my way out of that and it wasn't pleasant. So sea breeze fronts are fantastic, but for goodness sake, don't get on the wrong side of them because it's no fun at all. That um, is really important. Yeah. Don't get on the wrong side. Yeah. So if you, if you flip through to the, the next door and the next one, yeah, so you can see from that picture that I, I had set off with a task in mind, the gray lines, uh, and then ended up looking at the sky and I saw a, a set of really low level clouds coming in from the East Coast and thought, forget the points, forget the task, that just looks interesting, I'm going to have to go and look at it. Uh, to cut a long story short, I uh, pushed along, got a bit of a climb at Blair Gallery and was able to squeak across to just reach the cloud before the ground came up too close to me. And you can see from the, the barograph trace that uh, it was just below a thousand feet above sea level, so about 600 feet above Port Moak, when I reached the edge of a fantastic sort of roll cloud, almost morning glory, coming right in off the, the Scottish East Coast. Uh, got onto that, and uh, not a big flight, but I managed to run up to a boy and dinner and back in just gorgeous conditions. And it was just for the fun of exploring it. So I think you may have a picture there, Sam, if we go on to the next one. Uh, so that's Jakob, uh, who I met up at a Boyne flying the Percos. And uh, you can see just the huge difference in cloud, not much above the hills. Uh, as I say, when I picked it up, it was a thousand feet above sea level at cloud base. Uh, and the cloud base the rest of the day in normal thermals was about 5,000 feet. So huge difference. Uh, but you can run that just like someone's put a ridge there, especially for you. Uh, and, and lovely. Any more pictures of that sand or is that it? Um. Well, what I was going to bring up was the convergence chart for the day, right? Because uh, you had to turn at a Boyne because there's the convergence. There's there's Boyne there, and the convergence was a, you you picked it up here, didn't you, John? About here. Yeah, right. Roughly level with Blair Gary. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 made your way up. I've I, I can bring up some more pictures actually. Um, have I got them? Uh, uh, I, don't, don't don't worry about it. Yeah, I mean, I think the point the point is you you've been uh, eloquently pointing out that you can see these things on RASP. You can forecast them. Uh, the other side of that is when you see a piece of cloud way lower in cloud base than what you've been expecting, and it looks like it's moving in off a coast. Forget the task that you're on and go and play with it because it's just absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I actually replaced my pitch, some pictures of mine with that one, John, because it, it you know, that was really a spectacular day. And I'm, there's other pictures of you thermaling with, with, um, with, uh, with Jacob up at, uh, up at a Boyne. And you can find them, you can find them on the uh, Scottish Wave Hunters. Uh, if you go onto the Scottish Wave Hunters Facebook, uh, the the pictures there's some pictures you go back to you know as I say 2018 they're, they're there and there's some some stunning pictures um, but yeah you could have gone a lot further because but unfortunately you know you the sea breeze was going into into the uh, Aberdeen TMA um, fantastic fun um, I, you know depending on how long we've got and if people are interested we can show photographs afterwards uh, and so on. Because we're actually doing quite well for time, like 50 minutes. I thought we were going to be here for a lot longer, but we have rattled through. So convergences are, 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 are quite good, um, although they can be quite interesting. It doesn't necessarily yeah, yeah. happen a lot, but what one must be aware of it, because we were looking at the uh, buoyancy shear ratio, and, and that's, that's really quite important, because what we've been talking about is light wind days. But that's oft, not often the case in Scotland. What we end up with in Scotland is, is um, we get some uh, relatively uh, windy days. Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. 
can I stop you for a moment? Yeah, go on. Uh, so just a, a message flashed up on the screen there where Alec was asking with Seabreeze fronts just before we leave them about how close you fly to them. Um, uh, and I, I mean, I'd throw in my thoughts that pretty damn close to the cloud uh, and so a bit like wave experiment on the day where the best lift is, but quite often you'll almost have a wingtip in it. Um, uh, ex experiment back and forward, but expect to be pretty close. Uh, if but, I just, yeah. but again, don't get caught on the wrong side. Yeah, if I just go back, uh, where are we? Yeah, so you're actually inside the upper bit of it, but outside yeah. the lower stuff there. Yeah. That's about that's about it. What you do is you, it's just like a, a wave bar or, or or a ridge. What you do is you just come in. It's it's not sort of even or anything like that. It's it, it's not necessarily rough. It can be or whatever. It depends on the day. But what you do is you just what you do is you just come in. And you just come in. You just come in, just work your way in until you find the maximum lift and then work your way out. The thing you don't want to do is get on the other side of it, you know, because then, you know, you, you don't really want to do that. Um, and as you can see up here, but that's about as close. It's, you don't want to go into it, but just that's about right, I would say. Would you agree with that, John? Yep, that looks good to me. Yep. Okay. So, I was talking about um, one of the problems that you get with thermal days is is if the wind strength's too great, you start getting the buoyancy shear, and you also get wave. <laughs> uh, if you if you have an inversion on top of the cloud, then you know, you might well have wave. And what what can happen is you can have days where where the wave wrecks the, the thermal, or you can have thermals uh, which wreck the wave. And you can get a mixture of both, whether it can be, uh, and that's one of the problems. I mean, I always think that, that you know, therm thermals are like the Scots, they're all bitter and twisted. Uh, that's gonna make me popular. But, uh, you know, they, when, if you've got more than 10, 15 knots of wind, the thermals tend to get distorted. And on this particular day, I set a task and the wind was relatively fresh out in the west and sorry out in the east and slackening towards the uh, west and I set off from from Port Mo and I set a 500 and I got to Amal Ree and I looked across to the left and I could see that it was waving and so I just couldn't resist it so I climbed to 8,000 feet and John Galloway was flying. I think he did 600 kilometers that day. And John Galloway, uh, I, I've, been, I've been behind John. I got to 8,000 feet and then I got up to, oh, I don't know, about Blair Gary. And he then, because I just shot up there and then he caught me up and he couldn't understand how I'd been so fast. Well, the reason was because I'd been in wave. Uh, but from then on, it was all thermal. Uh, at this point here, I got down to about 1,600 feet. Uh, just to the south of Loch Ness, well, actually over Loch Ness. And, um, but as you can see, there was the wave. And, but if you closely look at the uh, satellite pictures, and this is taken as a matter of interest from, from the BGA ladder. And what you can do is you go to the flight details and if you click on here, you can, there's a section on it that says satellite photograph, it's at the bottom and it will give you the satellite photograph for the day. And it's already got the track overlaid. And there are actually modifications now when you're gonna be able to play your actual flight, just like see you, and uh, also um, play other tracks. I was using it the other day, we're experimenting with it at the moment, uh, whereby Chris Fox is doing a fantastic job where you can actually, I, I played a trace of a film myself when we did uh, our recent wave flight. Uh, which I found quite interesting. But you know, the point here is, is uh, this is a day where I couldn't put it on the hot wings ladder because I'd, I'd 
flown in waves. I, I just couldn't do it, so I, I didn't, um, which really pissed me off. But uh, but I couldn't because I I don't I don't part of the I could I couldn't a part of the flight was 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 in wave. But um, it's it's quite interesting. I mean, one of the things that John brings up quite a bit is is that where thermals are wave affected is is that if you have a cloud street, you can find bits of the cloud street that are working really well and other bits that aren't working very well because they're out of phase with the wave that might be on top of a, a thermal. And that's a, something that happens. So I, I, here's a picture of uh, me, as I say, I was ably assisted by a Dalek. Uh, I literally climbed away from 1600 feet just to the south of here. Uh, and that's a picture of, uh, of uh, Fort William. And uh, it's, it's looking rather, you know, one of the sort of things you look at the pictures and think, oh, that's quite cloudy. Well, it's not really, it, it, it's okay. And, um, and I thought I'd finish with, with a picture. Anybody know where this is? <laughs> Anybody know? Perth. Absolutely. Um, fantastic day. I, I, it, you know, look at the soaring conditions here. Really nice, beautiful day. And I'd come through these showers here, which was quite interesting. I've been up this way and I came through here and got through all this muck and then, and then came into this beautiful bit of air. So it can be quite good, just literally on our doorstep. So I think, I think that's about all I was gonna say. I was quite, I'm quite surprised how quickly I got through that. Any, any, any observations at all about what we've been talking? Anything, I think I think it's now it's it's time to take to take questions if if that's okay. Any comments you'd like to add, John or anybody, Tony, Phil? Yeah, I'll make a comment or two. I mean, sounds you've been talking about big flights and all of that sort of stuff, but uh, and tasks. But I think as, as as you and John have hinted at, it's if you're just setting out on this, it's it's just the adventure. It's Absolutely. just to try and go and have, you know, so if you find yourself over Perth in something like that, just just poke forward a bit into the A9 Valley and go and have a look. And if you don't like look, what, like the look of what you see, turn around and come back home. But if you kind of think, well, well this is not too bad, just keep having a look around the place. And, um, you know, don't be too hung up on tasks or something like that. Set yourself an objective, but but don't um, don't die in a ditch over it. Just, just uh, yeah, the objective may just be to at least fly in the mountains for an hour and then come romping back home safe and sound. Well, I, I, I think when I first started flying in the mountains, I never set myself tasks. I would just follow the energy. And, uh, and I would go again, as we spoke about before, is, is just going to the mountains. So, you know, when I was flying from a Boeing, I'd go up the D Valley, I'd have my field and I'd explore a bit lot further. I didn't actually set myself tasks. I'd just go in and, and, and just, I mean, it's beautiful and just go and enjoy myself and gradually extend my boundary. I think tasks actually, I, I think when you're doing early flying in the mountains, you don't want to set tasks because the last thing you want to do is get goal orientated and turn a turning point, which it, you know can end up badly. Just go and enjoy it. The, 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 thing that, the thing that really gets me about, about flying in, uh, in the mountains is the sheer strength of the thermals. They are just really good, really, really good on a good day. And, and particularly doing things like soaring a ridge and, and, and picking up a thermal off a ridge, you can do it quite safely. Um, the thing that you have to think about, you know, obviously, is is can I get back, or, or you know, can I get back to Port Mo? But the Oak Hills is is a ladder, and and you don't have to go into the mountains. You can just go across the other side of uh, of, of, of Strathmore and saw the hills around Dunkeld down to Creef, and you don't you you as Kate was pointing out you can easily glide back into, into the flat area and you gradually build up your experience. And I was talking to Bill Fulton this morning, as I was saying earlier, and, and 
just go and enjoy it. It's not about, you know, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. Just, it's a pleasure to sit there on a day like that and just enjoy the view. Oh, I'm rambling. Hey, what, you, what comments do you have about that? Sam? Yeah? Um, I'm not sure if I can trust the technology, but it looks as though we should have both Zed and John Galloway, and I'd love to hear their comments on this stuff. Zed, are you there? I think you may have to unmute yourself. No, try John. Okay, John, do you want to unmute yourself? I saw you on earlier. No, I'm here now. Are you there, John? Zed, Zed's here. Ah, that's a Zed. Mm -hmm. What do you think what about you what we've been to... saying then? Well, well, yeah, it's it's all good stuff. Um, you really just got to, as as we all did at one time, you've just got to push your boundaries piece by piece. Area by area, you know, I mean, you can't just bang straight into the mountains. No. Go and do something, something reasonable along the hills, let's like say out to Loch Lomond, something like that, uh, and, and then stretch yourself a little bit further by maybe crossing a couple of ridges. Looking, looking at the fields, you can see. I, I know we've got all these people that say, "Well, there's fields here and there's fields there," but uh, at the end of the day. You got to look, inspect them for yourself. Um, I'm not a great believer in. I don't think there's a hell of a lot of streeting goes on in Scotland. Yeah. I, 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 at the end of the day, in the mountains anyway, it's really all about what the ridges are doing to it. And you know, if the wind's blowing in a certain direction and the sun's shining in the same direction, you know where you've got to go. Went to the, went to the wind facing ridge. Um, and you can you can go a long way just flying along along the ridge lines. What's so, your most memorable flight, Zed? Most memorable in recent years. Well, I, I, I think my most memorable one is the five hundred I did a couple of a couple of uh, years ago up to up to Aberkirdar and then over to Strontian and then I said Loch Linny, and that was a good day. That was a that was a cracking day. But the thing about that was, having got to Aberkurder, the line across to uh, Strontian was basically on the north side of the Cairngorms. You weren't flying over the high tops. North side of the Cairngorms, Feshe, and then along the valley across to Balladulish and across there. Um, I mean, there's a lot of flying you can do without actually sticking yourself right into the the real bad mountain uh, areas. Certainly, the the plateau. The pla if you want to go to if you want to go to Linnadi from Port Moore, it can get quite uh, quite interesting trying to cross the plateau from mm. Pitlochry North. Um, it looks it looks quite forbidding, but uh, it's not that bad. Depending on the cloud base, if you get a seven thousand feet cloud base, it's just a it's just a topographic map underneath it, basically. Yeah, yeah. What have you got to say, John? Thanks for that, Zed. You know, John Galloway, are you there? I think you may have to unmute yourself, John. <laughs> no, we're not, we're not having much. Pointing out that flight that uh, John did, the 500, uh, I think that that is the first 500 triangle that's been done in a standard class glider in Scotland. Um, so coming back to all the comments that are being made, obviously people are doing very big tasks down south. The mountains do impose certain limitations. So somebody of the experience of Zed and John, it, it takes a lot of time, but you can have a lot of fun in the peripheries, as, as Kate was pointing out you know, last week, and as Zed has just pointed out, going down to um, going down to the Lomans, 
uh, going down to Loch Lomond, to Balmahar, and so on. You just have to get up to the edges of it to start to experience it. Uh, 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 and I don't know, it's, it's just makes life worth living uh, when you get a view like that. Any questions at all? Uh, Sam, can I just jump in? Yeah, go on. That's Graham, is it? It's you. Sand, can I jump in? It's Brian. Oh, Brian, yeah, go on, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, um, a good task to start with is one of the first ones I did in the mountain was uh, Locker and Head and Spittle. It's a 200k FAI triangle, yeah. no, and it's not very far into the mountains. And funnily enough, the first day I did that task and I ventured into the mountains, got up to Spittle after Locker and Head, and I saw a glider sitting on a hill there for hill soaring. And this turned out to be Zed. In fact, I mean, this this um, year Zed and I had a really interesting encounter with a couple of golden eagles up north of Loch and We stayed in the thermal for about five minutes with them. And it was great. That was a highlight of the year for me. You know, I wish I'd had someone in the back, back seat of the glider. We would have got some great photos of them. Yeah, the day, the day you saw me hiding in that ridge was I spent about three quarters of an hour about 600 feet trying to get a climb. Yeah, you went the wrong way around. I went the other way around and it was seemed to be a lot easier doing locker and first. <laughs> but yeah. there's, a, there's a good ridge to soar on just south of Spittle and there's plenty of fields up that valley. Oh. So I, I think that's a really good um, triangle to start on when you're just working your way into the mountains. The, the other general advice is just be careful who you follow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, someone asked me, could I follow you into the mountains? And as I said, I wouldn't follow me into the mountains. Sam, can I make a suggestion? Yes. Um, for, for people like me who are maybe a bit more concerned with a, a gentle tiptoe into the mountains rather than bothering about task setting. Yeah. Um, what I have found to be a great help was going on the walking and air expeditions to Feshi with, with our own glider. And from there, you can you can just gently go either side of the Spey Valley a bit and be fairly confident of getting back. But you're experiencing a completely different environment from round about Portmo. Absolutely, I, th I thought I'd I'd I'd, uh, I'd said that at the beginning, but no, seriously, to reiterate that, um, if you, I mean, Bob Bob's picture, you know, video was taken at, at Feshu. And, yeah, I've and they, flown with those eagles as well. Well, there you go. And um, and the thing is, is, is uh, I mean, you know, there's always a club expedition up to Feshi. And I will say that I think Feshi is the best thermaling site uh, in Scotland. Uh, and the reason for it is because it's right in the mountains. But the great advantage of it is, is that rather than you having to struggle from Port Moat to get across the valley, um, you know, which makes thermaling more difficult to learn in Scotland than, than you know, down south. But to go up to Feshi, uh, I, I, I really do recommend that because the great advantage is, I mean, they've got the fantastic ridges there and, um, and, it, and you've got your base there. So you've got your landing field there. And as that video shows, you're surrounded by the mountains and you can appreciate it all quite safely and it, explore the local area and be within landable, dis landable, be within the site of the field. You don't have to go far to get fantastic scenery. And I really do recommend going to Feshi, uh, you know, in the summer and so on, um, because it's it's a fantastic site. It, it, it is beautiful. Um, and and you do get an idea of, of, of what mountain soaring is like. Because, you know, like Zed brought up, you know, the business about crossing, you know, uh, to the northeast of Luna D. If you're at 6,000 feet, it's not an issue. At 4,000 feet it is. And the thing is, that you find is, is, is that on a good day, when I used to fly from a Boeing, I used to think of 6,000 foot cloud bases to be regular. I thought that was regular for Scotland in the mountains. 7,000 was quite a reasonable day and 8,000 was, was a cracker. But when I was based there, but obviously when I moved to Port Mo, I mean, what we're sitting around here is three, we're sitting around 4,000 feet. 
but we have to make our way to the highlands to start getting into the hills. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a matter of crossing, as I've said, you know, in that, that bit about what, what has the weather been doing? We're stuck to lot next to Lot Leven, right? You've got to cross the River Urn. Those are all wet areas. We've got the Ock Hills, which is nice and dry. That's our ladder. And you don't have to go far. I mean, I was talking to uh, uh, Kate today about uh, the Jedi group, about local small tasks. Well, you know, you've just got to go to the Ock Hills and you can be within gliding distance of, of the field. And that's where your thermals are. Uh, sorry, I may have rambled a wee bit there. But no, to answer your question, Alex, yeah, go to Feshi. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see, <laughs> I mean, the Cairngorms are three and a half thousand feet. It's gobsmacking. It blows your mind. Beautiful sight. We're going up there for the Interclub League next year. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sure. sorry, carry on. Sam, well, just two, two points. One, Interclub League is a fantastic way to get to know the rest of the country and uh, help the club and have a bit of fun at the same time. Yeah. And the second point, because I'm guessing we're kind of near the end. Yeah. Uh, this is the third thing that you've put together on Thermoning. Uh, and the amount of work that you've put into this is quite phenomenal. And just thank you on behalf of everybody for the amount of work you've done to set uh, these well. things up. It's not a two minute job. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure because uh, it's just so pretty. I like looking at the pictures. <laughs> Good. All right. All right. Um, so it's from the 1st to 16th of May, and the Interclub League will be the week before it. So it'll be the last week in uh, April, if, we, uh, all, if we're COVID-free by then. Graham, are you here? Graham Fraser. No. No, OK. Uh, be... Sorry. Uh, yes, I'm here. Is that Graham, is it? It does. Well, we, uh, well, has this been useful for you, Graham? It's fascinating. It's, uh, it's all things that once, once they're explained to you, you realise, yes, I've done that, but I didn't know I was doing it at the time. You just kind of fall into things sometimes. So actually, it helps greatly to understand um, how what what these sort of forms of lift that you're finding are um, maybe sounds a little bit daft, but you know you're in convergences whether you're in the mountains or sea breezes, and you just kind of think, oh, that's interesting. What is that? So no, it's very very interesting. And uh, like John said, uh, well done and thank you for sharing. Nah, well the experts uh, are people like uh, you know said John. John Williams, John Galloway, Brian, they're, they're the thermal experts. I only go in on the really good days. <laughs> Hi, Sam. Can I chip in a minute? Yeah, go on. Who's that? It's Colin. Ah, oh, Colin. Yes. Go ahead, Colin. I've just had a wee look there. I, I reckon there's 40-odd uh, people watching this, uh, this series of three presentations that you've given. We've all been really sort of quite entertained listening to all the experts uh, going on. My big question for you, you, asked, you suggested at the moment, uh, earlier in this presentation about the importance of being at the front of the queue. How are 43 of us going to get to the front of the queue? It's a, it's a bit of a problem, isn't it? It, it, it this is, I, I, I brought that up, right? Because it is such a bloody pain getting a look, you know, you really, on a thermal day, We've really got to be organised uh, to 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 pop off because uh, on the day I did a, that 500, I think I set off at about half past ten. I think John Galloway set off even earlier. He was away first, and um, and that's rare. You can tell. You get up in the morning and the air is uh, crisp. You feel it. A cold air mass. You think, Jesus, this is the right air mass. You feel it, you know it's going to be a good day. But yeah, it's a big issue. Uh, I mean, if you've got 40, well, let's suppose, let's suppose how many are actually going to go for it. 
let's suppose 15, 20. Oh, I reckon oh, you've, you've been so encouraging for out to everybody. I, I reckon you'll have at least 40. Uh, the, the, <laughs> the first half decent day in spring, there's going to be an enormous queue. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> you, well, the only you thing doing? we can hope is that the ridge is working sufficiently to get away. I mean, you know, to me, it's as soon as the thermal, if it's a good day, my attitude is I go as soon as the first thermals pop before before you know people realize it's actually quite good they well, I better go now it's a big issue you know maybe we should get another tug Colin yeah well I think we've got the facilities <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah well it's, we it's, it. it's hard enough to keep two of them running never never mind three yeah there's sound it's Aiden here can I say something please on. yeah as a slightly more novice pilot than all the, the people that pundits have uh, spoken. One of the things that I found very useful for me to push me into the mountains and push me further was the Interclub League, and I do uh, promote that and voice that uh, thoroughly, and the Mountain Soaring Championships, because that helps to follow the people who know a bit better than what, what I did. Uh, I mean, the great advantage of, of, of any competition is that... Uh, is that you sort of sit there and you go, I mean, somebody we're talking about, we, we had it at Port Moat last year and somebody was complaining about the fact that they didn't get airborne because it was raining. But the fact of the matter was, is, is that and, and one of the sort of things you think, oh, I can't be asked for this, you know, well, it's crap. But when you go on to a competition, even a little interclub league or whatever, you know, Anna Boyne, you know, the UK Mountain Soaring Concert, I said, oh, you got to do this. And you go, oh, shit, no. The weather's crap. I've got to do it. And you go and you surprise yourself as to actually think, oh, hang on a minute, you know. And it's surprising what you can do in crap conditions. And that's the great thing. And that you extend your boundaries because you wouldn't normally do it, but you're forced into it because you're doing a competition. Now, you've got to be safe about it and say, well, you know, yeah, that's for sure. But you really do find out how you actually miss a lot of good days. Yeah, thanks for that, Adrian. Anybody else got comment? Wants to chip in. All right, okay. How long's that been? That's been an hour and twenty. All right. We'll finish on that. It's all there. You just uh, you just um, you just uh, have a look at it at your own leisure. Uh, have a look at you know the, the various uh, areas and so on, and it's all there to review and uh, digest at your own in your own time. Well, thanks very much. It's nice for people to turn up. Right, and with that, I'll say uh, good night. Well done, Sam. Thanks. Thanks, okay, I'll see you soon. Thanks, Thanks Sam. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. See you soon. Bye. Bye. See you soon.